Mr. Toastmaster, fellow members, welcome guests. Tonight, I will take you on a memory trip of the last years of experience that I had in developing and understanding better the world of energy. A world that I somehow knew because I'm a techie. I studied in technology, I studied computers and digital networks. So electricity, we give it for granted. We know it's there. We plug in our devices and things work. But then, 2001, March, something happens. And I went on to looking for the images of that specific event and I plugged in Fukushima accident and all I could find online were pictures of the Chiba refinery close by Tokyo, about 250 kilometers south of where the Fukushima power plant happens to be. So this gives you an idea that there is some bias already in the way media reports in the domain of energy. This is a snippet of the fact that that nuclear accident prompted me to study more about energy in general. I really fell in love with nuclear, trying to understand whether it makes sense, whether it works, whether it's really dangerous or not, and finding my way, my truth, my information to better deal with this specific field of energy. And then I wanted to dig for more. I wanted to understand better how things are in broader terms in the energy field. And I discovered this gentleman. Let's see if this thing works. This gentleman's name is Alex Epstein. Alex is an American, and he is a philosopher by trade. He studied philosophy, and for some research, at some point, he ended up studying the history of energy. And then he discovered something very similar to what happened to me. He did it a few years before me. And then he wrote a book because the discoveries that he had in the field of energy became this book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. And that title might sound very, very strange for people. Putting the moral and fossil fuels together in the same phrase may make people cringe. So let's get a little deeper into this and try to understand what the rationale, what is the moral framework that a philosopher applies into the world of energy to make this happen. Now, Alex and I both agree on the fact that if you look at these charts, you will see that about 200 years ago, let's say 300 years ago, the CO2 emissions spiked up because we started to burn things for our own good. We started to burn wood, coal, oil, and then natural gas, which we're doing today in droves. And no wonder there is an increase in CO2 emissions. But look, at the same time, life expectancy more than double. We used to live about 30 years of age, 200 years ago. Now, the average is 70. And it's not a surprise when people reach the 90s or their hundreds and see three generations down the line of offsprings come to life. This is unheard of. Look at wealth, GDP per capita just went through the roof. People are doing more with their time, are making more products, more things happen in the world. And population is growing a lot. Now that could also mean other issues that, of course, we need to address. But at the same time, look at these. They're all looking the same thing. And in my view, they're all very much related to the abundance of cheap, plentiful, reliable energy. That is what makes the human life flourish. Now, globally, the energy discussion is, in many ways, biased, it's quite sloppy, and it is anti-human. Let me take a stab at each and one of, of, of these points. Why do I say that, in general, discussion is quite biased? Think about how normally you hear discussions about the green energies, the sun and the wind, and they're all nice and green and cuddly, and everything is cool and dandy, and they work wonders. And then in the same discussion you hear, oh, fossil fuels, they're dirty, they really just are bad, and nuclear, my god, it's dangerous, and it kills people, and the waste. Isn't there a big disconnect there? How can you compare only the positives of something with only the negatives of the other thing? Is that fair? How
how can you have a reasonable discussion when you make such a wrong, clearly wrong comparison? We must really start to apply logic and reason when we do these comparisons. Let's move on to sloppiness. And I have a good example here with the so-called climate change. Oh, the big grammar right now is sea level rise. OK, there probably is a sea level rise. Once upon a time, you know, it was fairly easy to go from France to Britain, and uh, now there's a channel. So clearly some water is coming from somewhere. Is it the glaciers? Probably. They're melting. Maybe there will be an increase in sea level. But how much? And in how long a time will we have that much of an increase? Is it a millimeter a year? Is it one centimeter? Is it 10 centimeters or a meter in a hundred years? Well, it makes a whole lot of difference. And if you go and look at the latest uh, doomsayer porn movies like you know, Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth, who are picturing 20 meters of water splashing through Manhattan all of a sudden as if there would be a tsunami coming, is that really reasonable? Or how about if it is maybe a foot in a hundred years? like this in 100 years of time. Maybe we do have time to think about a way to address that. So the sloppiness is another big factor. But to me, the most important is the anti-human issue. Because in most cases, what we see is this concept that humans are polluters or parasites. We are cancer. We're destroying our planet. We're really turning it into an awful place for to live. And I take offense to that. I disagree completely. In fact, the perfect planet premise, where we have a stable, safe, and sufficient planet, to me, is all wrong. In fact, we do not have a planet that's like that. In fact, it's an unstable planet, and we see things changing all the time. And we see you know, big events, natural earthquakes. We cannot control them, and you know, they change the landscape as well. Is it then safe? Well, so and so, because again, there's a lot of people dying, even today, and surely animal, and uh, you know, these things have a toll. And sufficient, oh, maybe for subsistence life, maybe for when the life was about 30 years in length, and then you would, you would die. So things have changed a lot since then, and to me, the goal is not to minimize human impact. No, the goal is to maximize human flourishing. We need to make sure that everyone on this planet will have the same exact kind of lifestyle we have, will have the same life expectancy, the same possibility to avoid having medical problems. For that, we need to give everyone energy. That is what changes things. So my premise is to give emphasis to the humans. Of course, humans will need to be intelligent and not to do anything really nasty to the environment, because that's where we are. But if the goal is to minimize human impact, then we should all kill ourselves, and the planet will be happy, just because we're not there any longer. But hey, we're animals, like all of the other animals on this planet. So the full context that I want to use here is to be balanced, to be fair, to take positives and negatives of everything, of every single bit, but to give an emphasis to the fact that, overall, we must focus on human beings and on human flourishing. This is the moral framework that I like to work with. Having said that, of course, energy is something that is clearly something pervasive. We see it everywhere. And the amount of energy that is being consumed right now in the world has doubled over the last 35 years, 1980 to 2015. Just you know, think about India and China and all the countries that are emerging out of poverty. They're working their way out of poverty. And luckily, there is a lot of energy available for them in order to do that. But take a look, coal, oil, gas, there's still 80 plus percent of the amount of energy that we need today to run the society. Just think about transport, airplanes, ships, trucks, buses, cars, commerce runs because of fossil fuels. There is simply no way today to do without the fossil fuels. So whomever tells you that we just stop using fossil fuels very quickly because we're destroying our planet, it means that there will not be any commerce any longer. It means that we will be stopping most of the activities that we do today and that we give for granted today that give us the lifestyle that we have. Also, the green energies, the renewables, they're really small. They're increasing 
but was it 14, 15 percent? And most of this is hydro and nuclear. And no wonder hydro and nuclear are two electricity sources that environmentalists really don't like for whatever reason. And that is really strange. So wind and solar produce maybe 1, 2 percent globally of the overall energy. It's very, very little. How can you even think to rely on such scarce amount of energy in order to move forward? Now, of course there's concerns, and it's actually natural that there are concerns, and we need to address them. What about resource depletion? What about pollution? What about climate change? Let me get to each and, you know, and every one of those points. Think of this. Nature does not give us natural resources. There are no natural resources on the planet at all. There's none. This is strange, like we all think about natural, natural resources, but natural resources become so when humans know how to use a raw material and turn it into something else. Without humans, natural resources are nothing. Oil was oozing out of the ground. There were badlands, places where there was oil there, patches of, you know, not even animals could go there. You couldn't use it as pasture. You couldn't put any agricultural anything. They were badlands. That's, that's how they were called them. Until we discover how to refine oil and how to make something really worth out of oil. So the point being here that today, even there are some things that we do not consider resources today, they are there already, and we can use them. In the future, new technologies will be available. Technology is the key factor. And that is why proved reserves of oil are ever increasing, which to most people sounds you know, ridiculous. Oh, there's a finite amount of oil. It's like there is a pool of oil and we're sucking out of it, and that's it. No. Oil is something that we discover and we keep discovering because we increase our knowledge and we make technology better to go deeper in different paths and find oil which is still economical in order to be extracted and produced and trans transformed into the products that, that we all need today for our life. So the amount of oil is ever increasing, consumption is increasing a bit, but today, not many people know about this, the USA are producing as much oil in a day as Saudi Arabia. That's how much oil the technology that the Americans have you know, developed through the years is allowing them to extract. And this is unbelievable. It would not have been possible even 15 years ago. Moving on to the other aspect, pollution. I like this quote. Nature does not give us a clean environment that we make dirty. It gives us a dirty environment that we make clean. Let me give you an example. You must have seen animals, even in a zoo or you know, a pasture, cows. What do they do? They eat grass and you know, where do they do their dung and thing? They just do it there. It's just a natural environment. So natural environments are rivers where you have animals doing their things in you know, water that, if you're downstream, it gets polluted and it's not really that good. So na nature by itself is not really that clean. We can clean it up. And water is a good example. We can clean water, we can put filters, and we can transport water from one place to another where we have dams, where we have better water because we're in altitude, and we move it elsewhere. So using fossil fuels, we have better water in many parts of the world. Without energy, it gets very difficult to have fresh water. And if you're close to the sea, Israel is a good example, they have a lot of desalination possible with energy because you pump water from the sea, you desalinate, you remove the salt from it, and you use it for agriculture, for instance. Again, technology with energy makes this possible. The last point I wanted to talk about, about pollution is Air quality, and that's a big concern. The more fossil fuel we burn, of course, the more we emit into the air. But at the same time, the better filters there are because of technology, the better regula uh, reg regulations exist for cars. Think about cars emission, Euro 3, 4, 5, 6. Now, over the years, the cars are you know, emitting fewer and fewer of these nasty chemicals. So even the air quality right now is improved just because the technology behind things has improved. The knowledge we have has improved, and that improves our life. Notwithstanding the fact that we're burning more fossil fuels 
than we were in the past. In terms of climate, another good quote, nature does not give us a safe climate that we make dangerous. It gives us a dangerous climate that we make safe. Think about that. Think about a thunderstorm. Where do you go you know, and look for shelter when there's a thunderstorm? You go in a building, probably, and the building is made of concrete. It's made of something that requires energy to be built. That's what we do in a modern world. In the past, it was not really possible to do so because huts were really made of maybe renewable things, but that were not really a good environment to be in. So, let me give you an example that is really working for today. You've heard about this hurricane, Harvey, in Texas. Unfortunately, 14 people died. And maybe that number would be going higher. But think about what happened in 1900, so 117 years ago, still in Texas. Galveston was completely leveled off. 6,000 to 12,000 people died. And there was basically very, very little search and rescue that, that could be done back then. Back then, we didn't have the internal combustion engine. We didn't have cars. You know, boats were probably rowing boats or a little more than that. So today, with fossil fuels, well, we can build backup sturdier buildings. And we can go and search for people using helicopters, using boats with motors. We could uh, use any other technology that is heavily related to fossil fuels in order to save people. And the answer is 14 people died compared to 10,000 that we had a little more than 100 years ago. This is striking. The big difference is, is amazing. And by the way, it is confirmed by a database which takes data from about 100 years worth of climate-related deaths. Back in the 30s, for instance, there were times during which there was a huge drought, which lasted a number of years, and there were up to 10 million people who died because of that drought. Today, there basically are no people dying from drought any longer, because we can move water from place to place. And this is verified by the fact that the moving average Work. Right now, it's decreased a lot to the point of having, compared to the 10 million we had in the 1930s, last year, 6,114 people died because of climate related deaths. 6,000 people compared to 10 million. That is a 98% decrease. It's not small. It means a lot. It means that we are better at protecting ourselves from the effects of climate because we have access to better energy. We have more energy that allows us to shelter ourselves and to go and rescue people in a better way should something extreme happen. The last point I wanted to, to bring is, is this chart. It's quite confusing, but overall this shows computer models that have been forecasting the possible warming that is happening. Some say because of human activities, such as burning fossil fuels. About 20 years ago, all of those models were forecasting a huge increase in temperature. Now, for the last 20 years, data was gathered in real life, real data. And what we see is that the data comes out quite different. So those models, well, how good they are. Can we really trust these models to take as a reference to create policies that would curtail the access to energy moving forward? Look how wrong they were. Could we make maybe better models moving forward? Because if we need to take decisions today based on those models, I would, I would shy away from those. That is the problem we have. So in closing, fossil fuels bring us unique benefits, really big benefits. Any person, any politicians, any policy that would curtail access to such fossil fuels, well, we must be very, very worried about what and we must be very, very careful because this might have a huge impact. And think about that in closing. We're, we're in a world where still 1.2 billion people, a lot of them in Asia and in Africa, are completely without any energy. Zero. They have none. And 2.7 billion at the same time have little energy. So little means it's probably wood and some charcoal and some dung that they can burn into their open pit fire in their hut. And that is by far the worst pollution that they can breathe. They will be dying, probably, 
because of the soot that they inhale all the time because of what they're burning inside of their hands. We must do something better for those people. In closing, if our goal is human flourishing, human flourishing, remember that, and we look at the full context, there is a strong moral case for fossil fuels, and we should be burning more fossil fuels rather than refrain from them. And so, as Alex was wearing that shirt in New York, I have no problems in saying that I too very much love fossil fuels, and I shall thank you for the time you gave to me, and there are more resources online on my blog, and I welcome any further discussion about this hugely important topic. Thank you.